Just going to play it for the Lord anyway. Well, good morning and good afternoon, I guess. It's uh, great to be in the house of the Lord. As I sit here working out these uh, songs today uh, for today's service, uh, it just uh, talks about Jesus, you know, like all of my songs do. The song here called, uh, what is the name of that song? He became snow, new of snow. He made it come, his righteous will. And he humbled himself and he took up that call. Love so amazing.
so much for this beautiful day that you have created. Thank you so much for being God. As I prayed earlier in the week, God, you are the only God. You are all that can be called God, for you are the author and creator of this universe. You are everything, and everything is in you. But Lord, even if there were other gods even if these other idols were true idols, these, these idols of these other false religions and false gospels and, and little trenches that people worship and make the God of their life, even out of all that, we would still choose you, God. We would still choose you. We would still be yours. We would still be sons of God. We would still be Christian in that we're Christ-like believers and you, because of all these other gods that are full of petty, they're, they're petty, just extensions of humanity. But you are God, you are holy, and you are set apart. And you sent your only son, your only son into the world to save us. Mm -hmm. These other gods, they just want to be worshipped and, and exalted and sit there and look pretty. But God, you did the work for us, lowly sinners. You saved us. So yes, God, we are yours. And we bow before your sovereign grace, understanding that we bring nothing to the table except for our need for you. We are completely and utterly dependent on you. Lord, thank you 
for the music that was played this morning that really hit home. Thank you for my brothers and sisters who are here today. Thank you, Lord, for those who could not make it. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that you bring into our lives that bring us closer to you. Thank you for putting your healing hand upon us. It's so good to see, see Roger just up and moving and, and with all that he's been through this week. God, we thank you and we pray that you keep your hands on this service. We love you, Lord. And we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And together, God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, it is afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I know. Usually these things, but that's okay. It is a day that the Lord has made. And uh, I just wanted to find the day I want to talk about really two things is one, partiality and allowing worldly influence to get into the church. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in James 2 in the first seven verses. I, I told this story before, and other people have told it before me, but there once was a young Hindu boy who, who read the Gospels and was enamored by Jesus Christ. One of the great things he thought, saw about Christ was that he was no respecter of persons or the things of this world. And he thought that the teachings of Jesus would be a solution to the caste system that was in his country, that, in the, that beleaguered the country of India. He was excited about this gospel, about this man called Jesus. But he went to one of the Anglian churches there. And these two big ushers greeted him at the door and said, No, no, no. You can't worship here. Go worship with your own kind. Years later, Mahatma Gandhi would write in his memoirs, If Jesus Christ had a caste system, he might as well remain a Hindu. That's why it's important. Now those, Gandhi's decisions were his own. He decided to go the path he made. But those two ushers, well, one they have to answer for the fact of how they use race and skin color, social and political stature to, to try and dictate who could come and worship Jesus and who couldn't. And we need to be sure that we don't do that with, with people either. So if you uh, read along with me in James 2, the first seven verses. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he hath promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man, are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? God bless the reading of his word. This concept is not that difficult to, to, to grasp. James is telling us in very clear concise and simple terms not to gauge the value of a person on their worldly possessions, their worldly appearance, on, on whether or not they are of the, the same tribe or breed of person that you are. I, there's only, I don't use the word race too much because there's only one race and that's the human race. You just got different breeds in that race. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the way I look at it. You just got different breeds. 
but we're all part of the human race. And he's telling us not to get it twisted. Not to treat someone based on their, on their value, their worldly value, but to treat people based on their value, their godly value. The value that they hold in God's eyes. And some of the most godly people you'll ever meet are the poor people. You got to remember, back in that day, there was no such thing as middle class. You were either, you, there were the haves and have nots. You were either poor or you were rich. And to see a rich person, even it darken the doors of your church, was a rare sight. You had them, but you didn't have, you, I promise you, you had more poor people than you had rich people. So it was when you got a church, when you got a church and a, a rich person shows up, granted, because you know you, the church has needs. People need to eat. People, you know, they need shelter, they need clothing. And then you got somebody that's got funds shows up. Oh, you want to give that, you want to treat that person, you want to make sure they feel well at home. And but you're not doing it because you're concerned about their soul. You're doing it because you're concerned about your pocket. And in the same way, someone shows up at the door of your church and they're in rags. They, they have nothing. And you're like, oh no. Another mouth I gotta feed. Someone else I gotta minister to. Guess what, buddy? Yeah. Because that's what God called us to do, wasn't it? God sent you this person to help. But see, here's the advantage what we forget so often. I do it. I'm pretty sure y'all do it too. Sometimes we forget Jehovah God. God is going to provide. He's not going to send you anyone to, to, to minister to without giving you the resources to minister to them. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, would you send somebody to Jody Bennett to fix your car? No, because if you send them to me to fix your car, you're going to be walking for a while. So if God sends somebody to you, it's be, he's going to send you the resources. He's going to send you the ability to minister to that person. And it could be that the rich person that he sends to you needs more spiritual healing than that poor person. Because that poor person, he comes in with an advantage. Poor people understand their dependency on God more so than rich people. Because rich people, I got this black, uh, what you call it, the black card, the MasterCard, Visa, whatever it is, with unlimited spend. I can go out and buy a yacht with this. I can use this card to go anywhere I want to go, buy anything I want, do anything I want, because I got this black card and unlimited credit. I got a billion dollars in the bank. Where you you're used to being self-sufficient. Whereas the poor people, they had to be dependent on the alms of others. They had to be dependent on the God looking after them. So when they come there, they already understand what it is to be dependent on someone. They also understand how the goodness of God is being used. Now this is most. You got some people, as it's been said, you got needful people and then you got needy people. You got some people happy being needy. They just want someone to take care of. But I'm talking about the people who genuinely come looking for God. Looking for God. The people who come not just to get fed, not just to get clothed, but they come, okay, clothe me, feed me, so I can go out and share God. Teach me about God at the same time, so I can go out and return that same favor that God's done for me through you. They got a better, believe it or not, they got a better understanding than that than these people, the Bill Gates and people like that of the world that's got unlimited resources. Money means nothing to them because they got so much of it. It's like if I could pay, if I could pay with for my bill for dead grass, <laughs> hey, I'd, I'd be paying the whole neighborhood bill because I got plenty of dead grass out there. So it's the concept. And for that reason, when they come in that door, we don't look. We don't look at the size of their purse or the raggedness of their clothes. That's a human being that God's brought to you. 
That's a child of God that he's brought to you. Now, it might prove that they weren't. They were just one of these people just trying to get a hand out. But God, what does God tell us? He'll separate the sheep from the goats. He'll do that. That's not our job. Our job is just to minister. Because also remember what, what Jesus said, and we talked about this before, how, how God said, when you minister to the least of these, you've also ministered to me. Because some, he will say, he will say, you, you know, come, my good and faithful servant. For when I was in need, you helped me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. When I was in the hospital, you came and visited me. And they'll say, when did I ever see you? When you've done this for the least of these, you've also done for me. And then there's the others that are going to say, because you didn't do that for the least of these, you didn't do it for me, so off with you. And we want to be in that first crowd, right? Amen. So we have to understand how we treat everybody. Your decision is between you and Christ, between you and the Holy Spirit. That's that between y'all. But we do have a responsibility on how we treat each other, especially how we treat others, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's an especial pertinent thing that we got to be responsible for, for. I don't know how many people, I know I use a lot of movie references. I don't know how many people have seen Rambo, the second one, where he goes to Vietnam the first time. And he's there, I think the, the young Vietnamese girl's name was uh, Cho Bao or something like Cho Bao or I forgot. But um, she asked him, why did he come back? He said, because I'm expendable. I'm expendable. And she said, what mean expendable? He said, imagine being invited to a party, but no one cares if you don't show up. No one notices if you don't show up. You're expendable. You don't have any real value to the people that invited you. It's invited just, if you don't show up, who cares? Has anyone ever made you feel expendable? Has anyone ever made you feel like, oh, I'm glad you're here, but, you know, but they didn't call to check on you if you didn't show up. If they didn't see you for two weeks, they didn't, they didn't show any concern. Have you ever made anybody, to your knowledge, feel expendable? So that works both ways. And we all, there's been times that we, I'm pretty sure I've done it, not intentionally. But we need to be real careful about that because when we love each other, we're going to check on each other. We're part of one body. If I cut off this finger, this body's going to miss that finger. So, you know, you want to find out, why cut it off? Can I get it back to tax? What can I do? So we, we, we need, when we greet people, like at church, when we, do, when we do the meet and greet, we all go around, we hug each other's neck, we shake each other's hands. But you ever notice some people will kind of give you the, the, the quick little hug, how you doing, and walk off. And then other people will give you a big embrace and they'll hug you and they'll say, how you doing? And actually stand there to, and wait for an answer? Which person makes you feel more like a part of the family of God? That second person, right? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Now some people might look at you and say, I just wanted to hug your neck and walk off, you know. It's just an expression, Jody. But, hey, that's okay. Then that's on them. We can't control how people do anything. We, this has been a common theme. It's not how people treat us or how they talk to us or act with us. It's how we respond. We can't control what they do, but we control what they do. I mean, we control what we do. So, Scripture is very clear that we're not to let uh, these worldly things or, or person's appearance interfere with us ministering them in a godly way. And that goes more than just wealth. That could be like social stuff. We, there's sometimes we don't want to minister to people because they look hard. They look maybe even a little bit dangerous. They don't look like they'd be receptive. I mean, you see somebody out there wearing a, 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 a biker jacket and, and it's got 
we got a thing on the back or something, one of the letters, things is they kill them all, let God sort them out. That person's not going to be that approachable, are they? You know, that shows what their attitude is. But they might need to hear the gospel more than that sweet guy in the white button-down collar shirt and his little bow tie and all that. You see, they, we need to share with whoever we come across. I mean, people might look at me and say, buddy, Dina said, Dina told me I got to shave. She said, because if I don't shave, she said, sometimes, I mean, she hasn't said this recently, but she said, I look like I should be out there holding a sign with asking for money and everything. I look homeless. You know, and some people might not approach me with the gospel. I wish someone would so I could share it back with them. <laughs> And then there's other people that walk right out of church and look prim and proper. They just walked out. They just heard it. They might need to hear it again, too, in a, in a real world setting. So we don't know, do we? I mean, we share our common, you know, I know I know some of the things Jimmy goes through and some of the things Roger goes through. And, and you know, it's because we communicate with each other. But how many people do we make feel expendable when they do come to church? You know, we, we, how many people do we do we, that come to church every day and, and we go and we talk to them for just a second or two, but we can't wait to get away from them so we can go talk to these other people we really like. We, we have to be real careful about how we let the work. The reason I bring all this up, when we show partialities like that, let me put this caveat in first. Now, if you got people that's got mutual interest, if you got musicians that like to talk about guitars, if you got fishermen that like to talk about boating, if you got uh, knitters that like to talk, is that what you call them, knitters? That like to knit, crocheters. I don't know if there's a, 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 a knit person. Um, that I mean, that's crafty people. They like to get together and do their thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's some people that you're naturally drawn to. I mean... Some people are more charismatic than others. And there's other people that you just fit. They might not be a fit for the rest of the world, but they're a fit for you. So there's nothing wrong with having besties and stuff like that. We just need to be conscious of the other people around us. So what happens when we start showing partiality, that's an avenue for the world to come into our church. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, when we start considering using worldly gauges, to minister to people who we're going to worship with and all like that, then we're using worldly standards. When you start using worldly standards, then you start doing worldly things. You start measuring your success as a church by the, the thickness of your coffers, by the, by the number of people in the pews. And you become stagnant because you get so much lost wanting to stay in that church trying to build this thing up when what you would be, be, we'd be doing is going outside the walls mm -hmm. and sharing the gospel with others. Mm -hmm. Dina calls this place, we were trying to figure out what we call what we do here. We call it a training base. We call this a place where you come and hopefully through me, the Lord gives you the gospel through his word. And then we go out and we live that life. And we make a conscious effort we're fixing to get to a season now where we're going to be going out, you know, Lord willing, making that conscious effort to reach people. And it's not because it's just cold and more people have need. It's because one thing that people don't realize about the holidays, this is when most people are so depressed, they are so lost, and the lonely people feel more lonely. Angry people feel more angry. Disenfranchised people feel more disenfranchised. And those are the people we need to come and say, hey, look, you're not alone. We're mm -hmm. here. The Spirit's here. You know, I know things might not be perfect the way you like them, but understand, instead of focusing on what, what you don't have, focus on the fact that I love you, that God loves you. Mm -hmm. And that way, and at least for a little while, they don't have to be alone, do they? They know, and you leave them with a feeling that someone cares. So that's why the church starts to do. But what, ha what happens in most churches this time of year? 
They're more concerned with the hanging of the greens. We sided the stage. They're going to put the Christmas tree. Then they are actually, where we're going to have our Sunday school dinners and fellowship, then they are going out reaching the people that really need to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be those kind of people, do we? Mm -hmm. So I think that we really should look at the first verse that we read today. My brother, show no partiality as you hold, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And with that comes three questions. <clears throat> he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, hath God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? He's not suggesting that God only chooses poor people. What he's doing God chooses people out of every race. So what can we do out of every race and social status? What can we do to reach those people? Are we going to reach just the second question? Okay, what can we do for those who are just lost but think they're, they're in a good situation because they have a lot? And the third question, what can we do for those that don't have much to show them what they do have? And you'll find joy in it. And in our own lives, we probably need to ask ourselves those questions. Do we get so focused on the material things in our life that we lose sight of the spiritual things? Do we become people that just want to set up a soup kitchen and feed a few people? Or are we looking to really win people to Jesus Christ? What's our priority? So that's the simple gist of what I had today. Is preparing ourselves. I love what we do here. I love seeing y'all here. But it is a training base. And it's time for us to use what we're learning and stop preaching to the choir. That's what I'm doing now, preaching to the choir. And go out there and preach to people that, that genuinely need to hear. We need to hear it every day, but we need to go out there and make sure these other people need to hear it too. So, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this for this group you got here, Lord. Just these. Right now, this, the people I love are here, and you brought them. The people you love are here. And it means so much for us to be able to come together and consider and talk about you and your word and what you would have us to do. Because the primary question that I hear most, particularly from the people that are in this room right now, is, okay, Lord, I'm here. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Give me, give me specifics. Because that's what we're looking for, Lord. We're looking for ways to serve you in a way that will benefit your kingdom. Not promote us, not promote ourselves, mm -hmm. not to promote this ministry, but to promote our Lord Jesus Christ, who did suffer the cross as propitiation for our sin. Who drank that cup of wrath so that we could wear the garments of righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. We ask all this and pray all this in your beautiful, precious name. And together, God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.